Welcome to The Behavioral View. everyone, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we'll tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Before we begin, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that we actually recorded this episode about 10 months before it's being released, so I apologize that some of the things that are being spoken about as coming up have already happened. Deterrence is now also operating his own organization and is no longer employed by Mississippi Behavioral Services. And we did encounter quite a few audio issues in the editing of this episode, so we apologize that there are places where the the sound does drop out a couple of times. But we still think this is an amazing episode, and we are so grateful for Deterrence's time and all of the amazing ideas that he shared with us that he cultivated while working with Mississippi Behavioral Services. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Behavioral Feud, where we're going to talk about capacity building. I'm Shannon Hill, the Editor-in-Chief at Central Research Institute, here with my regular sidekicks, Carrie and Nissa. You want to say hi, guys? Hello. (laughs) We are here today with the Terrence Allen who is the Director of Clinical Services for Mississippi Behavior Services. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today, Deterrence. I'm excited to be here. Like I said, I've, a lot of my um, trainees are watching the podcast and oh. they're just like, oh, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. So we're pretty stoked to be able to, to participate in this arena as well. Terrence and I have known each other for a few years since Mississippi is a small community of behavior analysts. And uh, I think everyone will be really excited to hear the things that he has to say. I've had many conversations about how are we going to keep people in this small market? And he's actually done way more (laughs) to prepare for that than I ever did. So I'm honored to bring you on and let you share some of these great ideas that you guys have at Mississippi Behavior Services. I just was saying, when you say small market, are you saying like in your all town, like in Mississippi being a small market? Mississippi in general. Yeah. Just not a lot of, not a lot of us there. (laughs) Not only not a lot, uh, we're really spread out across a few regions uh, uh, over the course of the entire state. And so you have North Mississippi, Middle Mississippi, and then uh, South Mississippi. Um, And a lot of the services are aggregated into, uh, I would say, like the South Haven area or Jackson area or on the coast near Biloxi. A lot of these service areas are really, it's really hard to get to services when you're in a rural area like that. Yeah. And that's actually where we met is we were both stationed in that South Haven area and ended up in rural Mississippi in different uh, school districts and such and just ran into each other and and became. And that's how I know most of the behavior analysts in Mississippi is bumping into (laughs) them in places where we're itinerant workers, basically. And the funny thing is, a lot of times you don't know who's who until you sit in in an IEP meeting and say, oh, you do behavior, too. (laughs) <laughs> and so it's like you're it's like we're going from town to town and, and it's a very odd and strange setup here in Mississippi. Yeah, but it has its pluses, too. It, it, it makes us those of us who do stumble upon each other tend to hold on tight. <laughs> Definitely. Before we launch in completely into all of that, we're going to be talking today about how basically building a workforce and supervision, how you're going to deliver that in a way that grows your own people and makes them want to stay. In our pre-interview talk, the Terrence told me a great story about learning some lessons about supervision, maybe the hard way. That's the question of the day we're going to kick off with. Tell me a supervision lesson that you learned the hard way. And anybody who wants to kick off with this kid. (laughs) 
Oh man, I, where do I start? And like I said, I'm just coming into this field at 18 and not knowing what behavior analysis was. And I don't even think there was an RBT model at that point. It was, you were a behavior specialist. You were working and under this science of this umbrella with no certification at that point. And one of the things that I've learned is that really trying to apply the rules of, of the science to my actual practice. And I just remember the biggest spell that I had was, and this was a few years back, I was a new director and I was preparing for a audit and I had a lot of pressure on me at that particular moment. And I'm like, I hear a kiddo having a, a rough time. And so I stop what I'm doing. And what do we all want to do as a behavior analyst? We want to save the day. And, that's, and it's almost, no, you don't need to save the day. You need to apply the principles of your science. You need to be able to observe and then act and then modify from there. And I just remember experiencing where I could go in for a moment and I felt like I could go in for a moment and fix it. Uh, but the amount of time that re was required at that particular moment was far beyond what I could, could, prov prov could provide at that moment. And here it is, uh, when I say learner, I was talking to Shannon about this. When I say learner, a lot of times I'm talking about the staff because uh, the staff are the personnel that are really hands-on. Uh, and, and we know the amount of supervision codes that, that we're able to utilize is minuscule. And so really trying to have that overlay there. And I came in into a, just to say, it was a, a pretty non, I, I wouldn't think that it would be a, uh, a moment in which I was even prepared for because the learner, the staff person was really struggling and I couldn't identify that they were struggling. And I was using all the science and I was saying, Hey, is it, are you ready for me to jump in? And there was aggressive behaviors by this, by the student. And I'm talking to the staff member, trying to coach her through it. And I remember she kept would she would keep saying that I'm fine, but a lot of times we're not fine. A lot of times it takes us uh, a second to realize what type of danger we're in and what type of situation or what base we're in. And we have this philosophy in which we and our clinic uh, at the end of each session uh, we come back as a clinical staff, as a whole clinical staff, and review uh, what we did and what we could have done better, uh, what was important about this uh, situation. And as we're talking about this and debrief, and I'm having this conversation with this learner, uh, I'm having this conversation with the staff person, and they're saying, you've never been in a room with a kid for four hours. I'm like, I've been doing this since I was 18. In my mind, I'm like, are you serious? And I'm like, no, I know what that experience, but I was so far removed because I've been doing this for so long. Things that I thought were easy for me may not be easy for everyone else. And so applying empathy, applying a level of, of care, respect to not only the people that we are supporting, but also the staff people that we're supporting as well. And that becomes a heavy, heavy responsibility. I love how you are what you said there at the end is that perspective taking is so critical when you are not only being like, oh, I remember when I was there, when you're recognizing that it's been a while, right? And your skills are probably far beyond that of maybe someone new in, who's providing direct care. But I also love what I heard in that too, is just that it's that person in that situation. It's not even you in that situation because you're going to show up differently and have different needs than that person did. So many times when we think about perspective taker, it would be like, oh, it's me in that situation. So no, you had to take the perspective of the, that person and all that they're dealing with in this time, in this society, with that learner, with that case and their skills and capacity. And it's not be like when I was an RBT or a, a tutor, I could do all these things. It's not about you. It's about them. And making sure that when you are thinking about all those things is, is about taking their perspective, not your perspective when you were. So that's what I heard in that. And I, and I love, I love like that distinction. I think that's really critical. And Carrie, one of those things that like it 
flabbergast me in the sense of, hey, did you not know the work I did 10 years ago? And I was like, no, I didn't even know what this field was 10 years ago. And so I thought I could, I had like street cred. I thought I had a built this level of, you should know me. Let me take my collar and <laughs> tell you what I've done. But no, it was very humbling. Mm. And it was almost like, oh man, my heart just dro dropped. And it caused me to actually then ask other people, like, how do you see me? How do you see me as a supervisor? And Truthfully, some of those clinicians at the time before I had to do an evaluation of myself, they were like, hey, you are not the nicest person to work around. Okay. And I was like, oh my goodness, I thought I was very sociable. I thought I was really outgoing. And one of my clinicians said, maybe in your personal life, but here you're missing the mark, bud. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> It was humbling. It definitely was humbling. It definitely made me go seek out additional supports. And this is, I had been supervising for a while and I forgot about the basics. I had to fine tune those things. And so I did some work with uh, Dr. Zara in South Carolina and she really hinted on, are you coaching? Are you establishing those relationships? And even as a professional colleague, she was uh, hinting at evaluate yourself, but also know what are your what do you want to gain from this experience? Since we really leaned on each other and she was very theatric about it. She was like, what do you think you did wrong? All of it appear apparently, Zara. <laughs> All of it. I've been saying. Like, I just need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, all of it. It's just not working. <laughs> but so many times I we hear people who get feedback like that and their number one thing is being defensive and being defensive. reactive, yeah. and providing yeah. examples when they were not. As opposed yeah. to what I'm hearing from you, you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> get it. Let me do like an examination across yourself. And you saw it to be like, oh, let me be better. Let me do better. Because apparently I'm showing up this way. So I need to, like, that's not an alignment who I want to be, not who I even thought I was. Whereas so yeah. many people are like, that's not who I am and who I thought right. I was. And therefore you're wrong. Right. Yeah. And that wrong perspective comes from, oh, I know that you're coming to my room to observe me and I can hear the sound of your boot down the clinic hallway. And something as insignificant, I was like, what do you mean? My boots and even my boots had become a condition punisher. I'm coming in and I'm like, okay, guys, I, I have a set of shoes that I keep in my office when I'm going out. And so that way, hey, I'm going to put on my comfy shoes. And You're quiet. <laughs> nice and quiet. Nice and quiet. Wow. I think that there's a lot to relate to in every bit of that. I will, I'm happy to go next. I will say there is a very good chance that I cry. This has been several years ago. I still am upset about it. It's one of those things that if I'm laying down at night and I think about it, I'm awake for several hours because I feel so terrible about this. I and I can't even say to Terrence that I was new. I This was made on in my career, but I had a trainee working with me in an adult residential services program. And the work there is different. It's different from what you're doing in a clinic. And I thought it through and I assigned to this trainee um, a case that was pretty straightforward behavior analytically. I thought it would be an easy win. And it was just one of those situations with someone who had more time in life for socialization and leisure activity than personal hygiene and housekeeping and that sort of thing. So that are, the student went in and did a great job in terms of building rapport and working through kind of a, a an adult version of a functional assessment where they're actually participating. This was a highly verbal client who could give her lots of information. So they worked out a plan together and it was working. It was great. But it was highly dependent on the administration of reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Students only there two days a week. And so someone else was to deliver the reinforcement on those other days. And what I failed to consider and why I feel so bad about it is I knew it. I knew it. And I just didn't want to know it. That person was going to feel so threatened about the loss of power 
because her plan was working and the plan they were using before had not been working. And it was a total shift from punitive oh, the measures to person positive. to deliver the reinforcer. Yeah, the person. Well, oh, the okay. <laughs> that's a new oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. And so because it's- that person didn't have the skills to deliver reinforcement without mixing it with punishment, behavior started being differential. So <laughs> students there, plan works. Students not there, plan doesn't work. And that blew up. That became a huge situation where that staff member sabotaged in so many ways. I felt horrible because I knew that person was that way. I did know that about that person. And I, like you to tear it, I had plenty of interaction with that person and knew that we, that I could have my way in the end. But a student doesn't have that level of street cred and was seen as somebody who was to be ignored or discarded or whatever. And I just, I think, wow, that trainee still likes me, still sends me notes occasionally telling me things that they learned while they were with me. And I just think, gosh, I'm so lucky you don't hate my guts and you didn't run from a a BA for her. You. I have an amazing team of of individuals that that work with me and they do a great job of keeping me grounded. And when I tell you having those people around you to keep you grounded really and having a sounding board for your clinical approaches is crucial. How much more impactful would have been if you said, hey, you know what, Carrie, this is just too much right now. Can you, what do you think about this? Yeah, And so many times our best ideas for me comes from either I'm talking to a trainee and I'm like, hey, this, I did not consider this. And, or I'm talking to a, another behavior analyst and I'm telling them about the case and I'm like, and, and it's something as simple as, hey, why don't you change the schedule of reinforcement from an FR2 to an FR10 that would easily fix it at this point. And I think so many times, particularly in Mississippi, we get in a point where we are dispersed across the state that it becomes regional. Oh, I have my regional friends. I have my regional colleague. But you have a whole network in being open enough to say, you know what, I'm going to call Carrie and Carrie's going to be able to help me. And she may not be in Mississippi, but we need someone that doesn't know anything about Mississippi culture to help. <laughs> yeah, because absolutely through. Years later, I was pulled back, misidentified the client. That's it. <laughs> we should have been working with that person to get them ramped up and ready to go. But yeah, you get in it and you're in a mess before you know it sometimes. I I remember uh, you and I were working uh, in a district one time and you never realized how the colleague collaborations come back to play later uh, in life. Um, and we were, I was looking at one of your uh, assessments and you were saying, hey, these are some things that you can work on. And I remember, I was like, oh my goodness, like, how am I going to do this? Uh, And you gave simple guidance and the simple guidance was just choose two or three of them. What's going to be relevant to that client and selling it? And I was like, maybe two or three years into uh, the ABA field. And it was things that stuck with me past there. Uh, And so those professional collaborations, I just think that sometimes we sleep on them. There's no class for, hey, how do you build friends as a professional? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's particularly important in places where we are dispersed this way. We got to have somebody to lean on and to trust with our scary stories. (laughs) (laughs) Carrie, Nissa, how about you? What's your true confessions today? (laughs) I can, I've learned so much over the years. I think that when I think about supervision and myself as a supervisor, I think about the word humble. I think I've been humbled so many times by so many of my trainees. One experience that I recall is in my first five years of uh, becoming certified, going into a home, having that, like the Terrence had mentioned, that mentality of I'm, the, I'm coming in to save the day. I have a plan. I know what we're doing. I have an agenda for our supervision meeting. And this was back when parents and the entire RBT team could be involved in a, a training session. Everyone was present and I'd submitted the training plan. The mom completely disagreed with everything I had submitted. Word for word, every single goal. 
and thought that it was an appropriate time during the team meeting in front of my seven VTs to tell me that she disagreed and didn't approve. And as a young behavior analyst, I sat on the chair of I'm the expert and I'm going to show you that I'm right and I know what I'm doing. And it led to a very uncomfortable conversation and meeting for all of the staff to watch me kind of battle it out with this parent. And this whole experience, the feedback that I received later via phone calls and emails from my staff were, that was very uncomfortable. I'd love to have a conversation with you because now I'm afraid to become a BCBA. Watching you handle that and, and not gracefully, watching you lose your cool and get upset was very humbling. I learned from that situation. I still think about it often. It's been 11 years since. It was the follow-up conversations with mom, making sure that I had consent from her, moving forward, apologizing for my behavior doing so in front of the team, it was just such a humbling experience because while I had these credentials and I was on the hook to supervise, I was not behaving in ways that a supervisor should behave. And it was, it was one of those situations where it was just like, we think that our supervisors know everything, whether that be our colleagues who might have more experience than us. And I think that there is this fear of giving feedback to supervisors, this fear of, I don't know how to tell my supervisor, is that in writing or the email or directly face-to-face that this situation I didn't learn from or I didn't appreciate. I think since then I've learned I would rather have feedback from anyone, whether that be a colleague, a supervisee or trainee, a student, so that can help improve my performance. I think that experience was like, I will solicit feedback any way you want to give it to me. You want to text me, you want to form so it can be completely, so your all of your information is removed. I just need you to tell me how I did so I can improve for next time. And that experience has shaped me since then. Those experiences definitely, as I hear it, the nostalgia of going back to that moment with you reminds me of, oh my goodness, four letters can give you almost like the will of God. Oh, yeah. I'm right and you're wrong. Just the four letters of being a board certified behavior analyst, it, it gives you, I just remember my, the first behavior analyst that I encountered, he would come in, he would look at treatments and he would look at how implementation was. And he just had this really cool persona. And I was like, oh, I want to be like that guy. But then realizing that you really have to navigate your own path in behavior analysis. You can't be the supervisor that you admire. You have to be the supervisor that is required at this point. And I I looked back and I was like, man, he really had this thing. And then later conversations with him, he was like, I'm just figuring it out just like you would. And so... (laughs) It, it's humbling that the perspective of where you're at in that supervision cycle, whether you've been supervising for six months or you've been su- supervising for 15 years, it's yeah. all an evaluation process of like, where do I want to be and how do I, how can I improve to a better supervisor? My isn't really so much like a particular moment as it was like a phase of my career. But I remember like early on when I was moving into a supervisory role, again, just how I just am and has always been is just very personable. And so I was very personable with the staff and the people. But now I'm in the supervisory role to give feedback. And it was hard for me at the beginning to give, I think, critical balancing the I'm going to care about you personally and deeply and be really approachable with, okay, I'm also going to give you direct feedback, that correct feedback. And so for a while, and maybe for some people, I I would just be like, oh, these are all the good things you're doing here. And then mention these things as a little bit, like, and just tiptoe around the corrective feedback angle. And, but then when you kept on seeing the error and the issue and it keeps on persisting in the case or that showing up across cases because it was just like a something that needed to be corrective just across all situations then I would get annoyed to then then my interaction with that person would then deteriorate whereas if I was just like clear and direct still caring about the person but saying hey you're doing it like this we actually needed it to look like this and giving them a rule and be clear about it and giving them the opportunity, that's actually more kind than I was trying to be. So being nice was 
just eating away at yeah. me and then not allowing that person the opportunity to grow because I'm not giving them, Nissa, to what you were saying, just want the feedback, but I'm a little bit hesitant about that. I, you know, sometimes I find myself in that now, but then I just take a deep breath and I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to go for this. And it works out great. And it's just sometimes it feels a little weird at the beginning if you have a close relationship with the person. But then once you clear that up, then the annoyance of seeing the thing like, oh, it's just even the formatting is off or whatever it is, right? Like, then just that clear, direct feedback is so much more beneficial to the health of your relationship and the progress for the other person so that they can be better and rise above. Feedback is tough. Yes. Feedback so is hard. extremely tough. Do I want to be Dr. Jackal or Mr. Hyde today? <laughs> oh my goodness. It's a matter of sometimes choosing violence or the perception that it's violence because it's really, I need this learner or the staff person to know that you have to implement it this way. And then really looking at, is my relationship strong enough that I can give critical feedback and it be accepted in a pragmatic way? It, it, that's one of the things that I think that even working with learners and clinics and in the ID world, trying to meet the person where they're at is a notion that of really establishing a level of reinforcement that is, that's going to get the response that you're looking for. I'm uh, like, oh man, I'm giving too much critical feedback and I'm not getting the responding that I need. So I need to probably just focus in on one thing and Carrie, I'm just like you. I just don't like confrontation. Mm. Like it doesn't feel good. Ah, if I could go through my entire life and not have a uh, confrontation, that'd be great. But I don't have that luxury. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I've actually had staff do the opposite because I am the same. I and I probably over the years have had definitely more staff say to me, tell me what I can do better <laughs> than I have. <laughs> You're hurting my feelings. <laughs> I've definitely had to work on that too, Carrie. I know exactly what you're doing. Don't worry. Hey, Shannon, we got to get in that secret word here. All right. Thank you for the reminders. That is a, an important thing. People want their CEUs. Secret word number one is teach. T-E-A-C-H, teach. All right. The Terrence, we brought you here to talk about how you can build and retain a workforce. And I feel like some of our stories have already gotten us going in that direction. Yeah. But you, in particular, are coming from an organization that's done a lot in terms of bringing people on board and trying to keep them around. So do you, you want to give us a little brief overview of, of what you guys do? What's your... Yeah. One of the benefits of, of staying in state of Mississippi is that you get to see the landscape of the entire state. You get to see why it's important to provide the services. I'm originally from Alabama and I moved here to go to school and I went to the University of Memphis and I was like, yeah, I'll become a behavior analyst and I'm going a, I'm a, I'm to a get on out of the state. Like, there's not much here. Like, that was the interpretation. But then when you see the, the impact of the lives of the individuals that you work with, it then reminds you why you do what you do. And I have one of the best colleagues. His name is Vargas Clark. And his ability to not only allow me to do the clinical portion of the agency and allowing him to only focus in on the business. That gives us a tandem that uh, I can be as creative as I want to when it comes to retention and recruitment because I don't have to think about the funding. I don't have to think about the dollars, which balances out. Uh, it, I can be as creative and he can figure out how to pay for it later. And he may not like it on most days, but those are, are part of the perks of, of being where I'm at at Mississippi Behavior Services. We're providing support to individuals, not only in, on the IDD waiver, but in school districts and in a clinic setting. And what I've learned in this realm of recruitment and retention and just really expanding the workforce is that it won't be, it won't be how much you make in this field that's going to make you stay at a place. Because right now in our current market, we stay, our home office is in South Haven, which is adjacent to Memphis. And you could probably throw a rock and find 10 BAs in Memphis. But where in South Haven, you can probably throw a rock and not find any <laughs> behavior analysts in, in South Haven. And that meshing of like, how do I keep the people that are here? 
And so some of our, we really looked at our supervision, the quality of supervision, really setting up right now, I think 13 of, or no, I'm sorry, 17 of our 40 uh, odd staff are in BA programs that include Mississippi State, Ole Miss, the Chicago School of Psychology, Capella, the University of Memphis. And I probably should put emphasis on the University of Memphis because I graduated there. Um, It's a great place. It's a great, nah, I'm joking. But I think that making those relationships with the universities and also making it where becoming a T isn't a terminal job. You, if you like what I'm doing, let me show you how empathetic, let me show you how compassionate, let me show you how world changing the science is because we all have those aha moments, right? Those, oh crap, this shit works. Let me do it more often. And I remember I was working and I was really working with the learner and I was really struggling and I was trying to get them to see the importance of why we should deliver reinforcement immediately and not delay. And she was in the learner or the staff person was saying, does it matter if I give it in 30 seconds or 45 seconds? It really doesn't matter, right? She was like, I'm doing what you asked, bud. What else do you want from me? And it was in that moment, I was like, you know what? Everyone is not in love with ABA as I am. Everyone doesn't have that, that, oh, man, we dated and I really like you. Like, (laughs) I I really like you. Some people, it's we dated and bud, I'm not going to call you back. (laughs) And setting up those aha moments are what we cultivate in our supervision moments. We are really, one of my colleagues, Dr. Marissa Harris, she does a phenomenal job of we bounce off of one another. If she is talking with her group of supervisees about, compassionate care, I'm going to then come in and say, this is what compassionate care doesn't look like. And so I don't have to script supervision because it is this almost generic or this really reinforcing event where I'm like, oh man, I have supervision on Friday. I want to be there. And so that's made learners want to buy into what we're doing. And giving them a lens to look at behavior analysis outside of this is the best thing since sliced bread. I want you to talk to other professionals. We bring in outside professionals to to then talk about other sciences, whether it's bringing in counselors or it's bringing in speech pathologists to connect with learners so that they can say this works or this doesn't work. Giving them access to the Central Reach Library. This also gives them a... (laughs) This gives them a ability to connect with, I don't want all of your information about behavior analysis, about this science to come from me, because I'm not the end all be all. And a lot of times I'm probably not as right as I think I am. And that happens a lot. And so that, that authentic relationship with supervisees has really shown what we went, I want to say, we went almost seven months retaining the staff that we had. And that was big because the market across the river from us plays at an extremely higher rate. Their their reimbursement rates are really allow them to flex their muscles when it comes to taking good clinicians away from the Mississippi area. And so I think that looking at that model of establishing great supervision, connecting with the university. So that way, when you take someone that it is not familiar what it's like to apply for grad school. They're first generation learners that are going to grad school. I don't want you to not apply for grad school because you're, you don't know how to write a letter of intent. And so we can support you there. If you are afraid of the research form, let me guide you through this research platform. And so that that way you're connecting with it. And so we've seen some success there and we have a pretty good, we have a pretty good software that we're utilizing. And I guess it's the pitch for BST as well, because they, if I can think of it, they can create it and I can apply it to our supervision and our performance management system. And so our performance management is, isn't just me looking at coming in for five minutes. It's also having peers look at you and your performance. It's, us using uh, video recordings and rehearsals. So that way you see what you're doing. Uh, and it's not just where uh, I am like the, 
I am like this guy that is a madman coming in saying you need to be better. It's this group of people supporting you to be better. And that is what I really seen that has is, is helped us retain the people that we have. I want to back up to what you were saying about the university relationships, because it sounded like some of the things that you were talking about in terms of getting them into university makes a lot of sense, right? It, it, that sometimes there's those obstacles that we don't even think about as being obstacles. Had I read a letter of intent, I, I've never really thought of that as a reason that someone wouldn't apply. But you guys are actually looking at it from the very, very beginning, not just once they're in and how to help them through, but even in terms of how to get them in there. Yeah. And I think that we've known that the individuals that we have in that RBT role, our goal is not to have them in that same position for beyond two years. And that sets the stage for, hey, you've been successful. You're now in a point where you can be maybe a lead RBT or you can be a peer support RBT. And then you see that, hey, what are all you guys staying late on Friday? I want to have a bit of that. You guys are having too much fun and supervision on Friday afternoons. And yeah. And so now it's almost like people want to be in that cool club. They flock to the ability to stay. And it's weird because I say, hey, our staff meetings will be Friday afternoon. And my colleague says, she says, no one has meetings on Friday afternoon. Why <laughs> Friday afternoon? But and. It, it works. It works in the sense of now, if you're coming to supervision on Friday, it's because you want to. If you're coming to supervision on Friday, I will guarantee you that it, we, the model that we pull from, you're not, we're not watching videos. If you guys remember in the 90s when they would bring out the card and when the teacher <laughs> would bring out the card That's and not, yeah, it was dropped to the top of it. <laughs> 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 on it or, yeah. <laughs> so, like, you're, that's not the experience that you're going to have in supervision. The experience that you're going to see is that I'm going to unpack these experiences that I've had in 13 years so that you don't have to, you'll be equipped to to then face those challenges. Whether it is we did a, a role-playing scenario this last uh, week in which we set up a situation where the parent or the caregiver was extremely disgruntled. And one of the things that one of my grad students, the first thing that she said was the parent was disgruntled about the plan. And she said, the plan is great. I wrote the plan. And I was like, (laughs) ma'am, no, insert empathetic statement here. This is where we need to pivot. it. And and as we had this discussion and I'm saying all the right things. And I said, I'm not saying, I'm not here to tell you if it's right or wrong. I'm here to encourage you what may be effective, uh, what's going to solve the problem, because we still hadn't heard what the parent said. And even if it's not just the actual words, but the intonation and the intent and the, like, motivate, right? Like, you can teach your partners, right? Yeah. I love how you're using the term learners to talk about the, your BCBAs that you're providing supervision to. That's great. So many times we do this also with training with learners. Here are some praise statements. Here are some things you can say. Here are some empathetic statements or something like that. But the delivery of those, you can say all the right things and you can use the best wording, whatever, non-threatening, whatever. But if no one's buying it, then it's not effective. You're not actually not doing what you need to do. Better use your own words, but it's more about that motivation behind it. Is you really care about how the parent feels about this behavior plan? Or are you just saying this so that way you can check it off a list and be like, I told them that they could give me feedback. But if you told them in a way that it doesn't make them feel like they can give you feedback, right? Then that's not going to happen. And there's um, cultural so that, stuff. Is, it's not just about exactly. what, what I'm comfortable saying, but I can tell you, and Terrence, you can probably back me up on this. If I go to a school in the Mississippi Delta and I'm talking to teachers there, I sound very different than when I go to a school 
it's Mississippi the, <laughs> because the culture is very different and the way to get people on board and motivate and to trust you is extremely different. So you've got to not only be genuine in yourself, but you've got to be able to match the needs of whoever you're listening, who's listening to yeah. you. Yeah. One of the things that I love, even in that space and in that model, I was not privy to the background of all of my supervisees. The two people that I asked to do the role playing, I wasn't even privy that this parent, that the person playing the parent actually had been in a situation in which it was like close, oh, wow. near and dear to her heart. And she was able to give you authentic feedback in saying that, no, don't tell me this because what the way that you just said it was that you're right and I'm wrong. The way that I perceive what the guidance that you were saying is that you're going to come in here and save it. And what happens when you're not there anymore? And all of these things were coming up and it was like word vomit. And the learner was like, I didn't know that. I was well, getting too real, too quick. And so that <laughs> sets up. And then we didn't even anticipate the cultural differences of the two individuals that were in the role playing. And so there were things that we had to slow it down. Like, oh my goodness, we're, you don't have to solve this new BA. You don't have to solve it right now. It's okay. And these are the things that I would have told myself. Hey, yeah. parents, stop it. You, it's okay. Listen, actively listen. Like affirm and repeat what the person just said and make it make sense. And so that was one of the things that that with me and it was salient. And I was like, nobody ever did this to me. Like no one ever said, hey, a parent is talking. Shut the hell up, my guy. <laughs> one, of, one of the best pieces of just advice that I ever got was from a, a guy named Van Tomasulo. I don't know if any of you are aware of his work, but he actually calls himself psychodynamic. And he, but he does special interventions for, it's called interactive behavior therapy. And it's groups for people with individual, with uh, intellectual disabilities who are sexual offenders. And Although he's calling it psychodrama, it is role play from my point of view. And, yeah. but I remember him as he, he would lead the, the training groups and he would tell you what he is thinking as he's watching the group mm -hmm. unwrap. Our therapist, this is what I'm doing. And he admitted 40 years of experience. I'm sitting here thinking, oh, shh, what am I going to do with this? And yeah. the word of advice is slow down the action. Just mm -hmm. slow down the action. And how do you slow down the action? That must have been very stressful. I hear your pain. It's just this, these very basic skills that we learn really early on of reflecting and empathizing. And even just what I just said, just slow down my speech pattern. And suddenly, <laughs> all of that stuff that seems insurmountable, I, I have time to think about what I'm going to do next while I'm slowing this down. And I thought, man, that is great. That is great. I have held on to that forever. It makes you feel so much safer. And, and the worst place to figure out that you don't have those skills is in the face of adversity. You're like, oh my goodness, I just had, oh, I'm becoming very competitive with this parent. And I'm like, ugh, like, no, I should probably stop Not a good here. time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Christians are a much better place to do that. Yeah. I was telling my parents, like in therapy, in a, as a counseling master's student, we had all semesters where we weren't allowed to do anything except empathize and reflect back. You couldn't do anything therapeutic if you don't, if you don't consider those things therapeutic. And I do think that's something that is probably missing from training. So it's cool to me that you can build that in your supervision sessions. Yeah. Our, our supervision definitely pretty kick ass. And I just wasn't, I wasn't sure if it was like, I think, like I said, we all have this love story with ABA and I think that each person's love story is different. And I really was trying to come off as this authentic supervisor earlier on in my career. And I was like, you know what, we're going to, we're going to just go back to basics. Let's just unpack. What is it that you need from this session with me? And how is it that I can meet you where you're at? And am I coaching right now? Or am I, and, and, 
And I really give this autonomy uh, to our learners to say, you know what? I don't know it all, but I'm going to teach you the scientific method or the attitudes of a scientist that you can now apply. And then you can now say, Terrence, I know that you said that, but this bit of literature says this, and we could probably set up a design that's going to tease out these things. And when we get to that point, I, I'm now looking at you as a colleague versus a supervisee. And that's the speech that I say for my second year students when I get to the point, hey, you're about to be my colleague and I, I really need you to, to, to bring your A game. And so it, when you get to that second year of training, first year, I'm really leading you down the pathway. I'm giving you all the information. I'm giving you the resources. But the second, you're a colleague because what happens is even if you don't stay with our agency, the interpretation is that once you pass your exam, what do we all know? Every agency wants you to be ready right now. And it's a disservice. It doesn't feel good to be thrown in a position that you're not equipped to perform in because you have letters and that gives you this, this extra ego or this extra confidence. They told me I'm ready, but you've only been certified for three weeks now. What are you doing? <laughs> this model kind of sounds a bit like methodic. Uh, instead of just for a particular skill, you're applying it just to the organization, right? Nita Archer would call it like, I do, we do, then you do. Or in other words, you're like model, test, relief, right? But it seems yeah. like I love how you give that perception. It's okay, together I'm going to give you tons of support. Then we're working simultaneously and then you finish your thing and then I release you. Do you have in your model when you have someone who's just a, a really new BCBA, do they still receive some level of supervision and guidance? Obviously, maybe like the clinical director or something like that, but do you have it where it's, you're still a little bit in this training module because you're like, now I don't want to fully release you because that's a little scary, but more of a release and test type of situation yeah so one thing that we we're not fortunate to have a lot of new BAs, right and yeah. so the reason why is because our market is so small and so if i'm yeah. getting someone it's 90 percent. it's probably someone i've already trained and because i have to grow my own talent i pulling people to come into state is usually is if you come into if you're coming into state it's probably because Something has brought you there and it's probably not, fortunately, it's probably not behavior analysis. It's usually, oh, we found a bit of property. It was really nice out here. We went on the coast. It, it's really, South Haven's really close to Memphis. We really wanted to move to Memphis, but South Haven had availability earlier. And gro grooming that talent when we first get them, grooming that talent so that we're small enough where here it is, if you're coming in new, you're still working hand in hand with me because not to say that I'm a control freak, but I just, I want to be the director that I needed when I was a supervisor or supervisee. And so that becomes a, a paradigm shift where, oh, you now are writing a plan and then you're submitting it to me and your colleagues. And now you have to to bend that to so yeah even our master bcbas are submitting stuff and we're now having that peer review hey guys and we've even used it as where trainees like no one person knows everything i've had trainees come in and a bcba is presenting uh their plan and the trainees are like have you considered this but we do it in such a method in which it's not demeaning you want that level of support you know that the people around you want to see you be successful. And I think when you set that, when you set that stage up then and you have those resources and it's not that cookie cutter, oh, you are a behavior analyst. You can tackle all behaviors and you can do everything. And that hero syndrome, why does it keep coming back up? Like, yeah. why do we as behavior analysts want to be sentence. heroes? Yeah. Do you guys, <laughs> you guys use some sort of assessment just an overall assessment of skills that while you're approaching the supervision and training this way, how are you tracking their progress? So we have a, we've created our own assessment for our agency. And a lot of times we, 
will, you would think that you would use something standardized, right? Oh, I can pull from this bit of literature. And I'm like, no, I want to see how you perform on what I'm asking you to do. And then that gives me, am I giving clear and con uh, concise instructions? And so this is built into that BST system in which we can track the data performance across various metrics or environments. So whether you're working in our clinic setting or you're working in the school-based setting or you're working with the individuals that are on the IDD waiver, you're getting that feedback. And it's, it's formalized in such a way that you can see on a graph, very elementary, you can look on your graph and say, oh, I'm on an upward trajectory to be successful. This then informs the learner you're doing well. You're not just, I'm not just telling you that you're doing well. But I can also see the data to support what you're doing. And then likewise, I can definitely tell when a learner is more than likely on the point that they are ready to resign. So much I had a learner this last year in which the projections were showing where three, two months in a row, I saw where the data was showing where the learner was going, just regressing. And I'm like, this is a downward trend. What's going on? This prompted me to have a discussion with her. Well, what's going on? I'm experiencing some pretty significant life events right now. How can I support you? Can you not give me the tough clients on Wednesday? I like really struggling here. And then, oh, I didn't even know that my facial expressions were doing this. So now you look at the video modeling. And now that same learner came back later and told me I had already filled out my letter of resignation. I was ready to go. And so I was like, whoa, the data... Let me know, like way before, this was a pretty good indicator of what, uh, what I needed it to do. And then from there, she's now in grad school. And I was like, whoa, kudos to you. You really changed your trajectory. And she looks back at her own data. She was like, oh, yeah, that was not a good two months there. And so we laugh <laughs> about it now. And she, this is the same supervisee that comes back and says, yeah, but you weren't a good supervisor then either. So it wasn't all just the learner's fault. It was my fault too. So yeah. I had to evaluate on all ends. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's that for clarification, BST is Behavior Science Technology, where we did a, we've talked to them on a podcast. But what, sometimes when you say BST, so I don't want people to be like behavior skills training. It if yeah. they have a product, <laughs> right. but yeah, BST is an actual software product that has a partnership essentially. Yeah, and what great yes. data you collected, and honestly, in your own performance as a supervisor, kudos to you in in supporting that that trainee and that learner. Do you have any plans well, to publish this guidance? Because I think a lot of people are going to be like, "What? You could predict somebody was going to resign." Have you <laughs> yeah. So we're definitely, luckily, luckily enough, I'm in graduate school at this point. And so I'm back in school again. Why would I be a lifelong learner? Why do this to myself all over again? It's crazy to me. My kids are like, dad, dude, you've been in school longer than I have. And I think that over, over the next few months, I'm really aggregating that information to really get it up for a uh, publication, even if it's just a a case study just so that other individuals can see what I learned. I think that so many times getting in that arena for research for practitioners, hey guys, it's scary. I don't want to sit down and write up what I did and I just know that it worked. And so now there's a push to, for me and the supervisors that I had, I just can't tell you, you should go do research. Like now it's like, oh, put your money where your mouth is. We'll do research yeah. together. And so having like supervisors that not only hold me accountable to what I'm doing in ABA, but me also looking back at we're doing some phenomenal stuff. We were working on a project where we took mid-level managers and we taught them how to, to train session notes and then track the data of the performance of their training ability because we all know what is it? Have you ever did a re release of information and you've gotten someone else's session notes and you're like, where do I start for treatment for this kiddo? What did you leave me? It doesn't make any sense. And we don't have the time to sit back and wait for us to figure it out. We want to make sure that that congruency of care is is car carried out, no matter if you're getting support in North Mississippi or in, in South Mississippi.
Well, okay. So going to be a while before you give us that written guidance, but I just saw you on the task force of some sort. What was that? <laughs> oh, wow. Working with BSD or behavior science technology, they recruited me to work on their OPI task force in which we're really, really looking at the the ways that we can improve the performance of organizations and kind of come up with the standard together. And so I think that's a great, Some I keep forgetting all the things that I'm involved in at this yeah. point, which is <laughs> not good. And that also gives the spill for some of the data that's going to be presented at APBA and ABAI as well. I look forward to presenting the data and then being able to hash it out there as well. <laughs> Um, Shannon, we need a secret word. Thank you so much. I don't You're know why I, I cannot <laughs> agree with Second, Secret word number two is grow. G-R-O-W. And we're going to be back in just a minute with secret word number three. <laughs> I owe you guys one last secret word. This one is barbecue. <laughs> and there's a quiz associated with this word for the team. Well, barbecue. first, you can spell barbecue because there's multiple ways you can spell barbecue. Yeah. So, so it's it's B -B it was B A R B E C U E barbecue. <laughs> Q U E, okay. C U E. Not saying I'm not the best speller, but that's how I would. Okay. It'll be a list to pull from if you see a Q or C. Go ahead. <laughs> sure. I'm going through it. All right, where's the controversy around barbecue? Is it something you do or is it something you eat? Ooh. Yeah. What do you uh, say? It's, well, for I think me, it's it, too. <laughs> me. <laughs> but I live in Texas and it's something you eat here too. It's something you eat in Texas? Yeah. It's something you do. I say it's something that you eat. You do a cookout. You go to a cookout, yeah. at the cookout, yeah. like that's a, but do other people in cookout can serve barbecue. Do other people in Reno see it that way? Or is that because I don't know. Live? It could be my, yeah, it could be more <laughs> my, <laughs> my central Florida <order> route. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I don't know, they yeah, think right. they grill. They it's like grill. Yeah. It gets very convoluted very quickly. Yeah. So very, no very one will quickly. forget the third. It worked. We have helped drill that yeah. in for you. Oh, Deterred, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been delightful as always. I certainly and, appreciate it. And thank you guys. Yeah. We hope that everyone will join us next time. And until then, go on back and get your CEUs, fill in those secret words. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thanks for watching this episode of The Behavioral View. To get your CEU, follow the link in the instructions below. You can then go to the attendance verification quiz where you'll enter in the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate. If you've already done the work, you may as well get the credit. <laughs>